What's up guys, Doll Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Arbiter Ian video. It's been a while since we've done one of these. Uh, and yeah, we've got some more Warhammer content, which will make some of you guys happy. I know a lot of you guys always ask, if I don't do a Warhammer video that day, it's like, where's Warhammer? Where's Warhammer? So anyway, this is the Badab War retrospective from the 80s White Dwarf to the Naughties Imperial Armor 40k archives. So link to the original video down below, and let's jump into it. Euron's an alien shapeshifter. Didn't see that coming. The Badab War is a recurring part of the 40k background that's been around since the days of Rogue Trader. It's the story of how a group of Space Marine chapters rebel against the Imperium and the localised civil war that follows. But this isn't the usual 40k story of worlds or chapters falling to chaos and Space Marines battling warp-spawned horrors. The thing that makes the Badab War interesting is that it's almost always been a story about the mismanagement and inefficiency of the Imperium, and how its own institutions can easily end up on opposing sides. And for practical reasons, that's a really useful thing to have in the background. It's an example of why two players' Space Marine forces might end up fighting each other, which is useful in the early days of any game, especially when there are limited model kits available. Okay, so, so a lot of this was just out of, like, basically for a RP reason or RP justification for this to happen. Because obviously you have Space Marines versus Space Marines, and neither one's a Chaos faction. It doesn't really make sense for them to be fighting. In this video, I'm going to look at the history of the Badab War's existence within the 40k background, from its first mention to its most recent incarnation, and how the story has evolved over the years. What I'm not going to do is tell you the entire story in minute detail. This will be long enough, and I'll save that sort of thing for another video. The Badab War first appears in a three-page article in White Dwarf 101, May 1988, later reprinted in the White Dwarf Compendium in 1989. This is only a few months after the release of Rogue Trader in 1987, and White Dwarf's really ramping up the amount of 40k content it's doing. The scene is set in this first half page of text. In 901 M41, Lufthuron, the master of the Tiger Claws, attacks an Imperial fleet. In 40k, chapters of Space Marines are required to send a portion of their gene seed back to Terra every so often to check purity and sort of work as a reserve. And the well, Adepts we'll Mechanicus had long complained of the Tiger Claw's tardiness in submitting these. When the Imperium sends a fleet to investigate, the chapter rebels, mostly due to Lufthuron himself being a power-hungry and ambitious individual who should never have risen to power within a Marine chapter. This is repeated a lot. Also, he might be an alien shapeshifter or a recently manifested psyker, it doesn't elaborate, but the theme seems to be that whatever systems exist to stop a power-hungry maniac from taking control of- Th That's interesting, the fact that he might be an alien shapeshifter and that the other space marines didn't notice it. Th that's kind of interesting, that's a cool story. A marine chapter in the Imperium have failed, and the Imperium is going to pay the price. In 903, three other chapters join the war, the Lamenters, the Mantis Warriors, and the Executioners, and they capture a Firehawk ship while attacking Imperial shipping. The Emperor himself recalls the Marines errant to help out, but they mostly end up protecting shipping lanes. The Red Scorpions and Minotaurs are redeployed to the area and secure the space lanes, ending the threat to shipping in 906, and the Red Scorpions tag out in 907 for the Nova Marines and the Howling Griffins, who continue the space patrols. In the meantime, the Star Phantoms besiege Badab itself, while the Minotaurs go after the Mantis Warriors, and by the end of the war in 912, elements of the Exorcists, Fire Angels, Salamanders, Space Sharks, and Sons of Medusa have all God been damn. involved. In the <laughs> aftermath, the Mantis Warriors, Lamenters, and Executioners are given the Emperor's forgiveness after a hundred-year penitent crusade. The remaining Tiger Claws run the Star Phantoms blockade, and around 200 Marines get through, but nobody ever hears of them or Lufthuron again. So that's the broad outline as it stands in Rogue Trader. Huron was a flawed individual, and when the Imperium insisted he pay his tithes, he rebelled, which escalated into a long and complex conflict, bringing in elements of loads of loyalist chapters. All that's just half a page of text, but the real thing remembered from this article is the Space Marine illustrations by Gary Chalk. At this time, this would have been a huge expansion of published Space Marine chapters. Man, that, yeah, I want to go back to that for just a second. The artwork in like these old ones is so fascinating. It's honestly, it's it, like it looks so much more um, cartoonish and childlike. In and I don't mean that like I don't mean childlike in like a derogatory sense. I mean just like the way it's designed. It almost seems like for children. Whereas like everything now seems like much more um, 
like realistic. Like just the way it's drawn, it seems like it's a lot less supposed to be for kids. Whereas back then, it seems like it was very much supposed to be for kids. I don't know if uh, if that that was like an intentional design choice, or just like a, a natural. You know, as you try to make things look more and more badass, they just tend to look more and more realistic. Illustrations by Gary Chalk. At this time, this would have been a huge expansion of published Space Marine chapters. Most people would only have seen the 12 Rogue Trader ones. But one of the things that makes them so interesting now is all the variant schemes and camo patterns that various chapters used in various campaigns. Some chapter schemes and symbols are recognisable. The Red Scorpions, Marines Errant and Lamenters are all relatively similar. But some are totally different, like this Sons of Medusa symbol, or this, the first mention of the Salamanders in their original lizard skin scheme. That's Over cool. 20 years, mentions of the Bad Ab War pop up here and there in the background, from full retellings of the story to occasional additions in little box outs. The story often comes up in the various Chaos Space Marine codices, like this, the second edition Chaos Codex, the first to feature Huron Blackheart as a special character. In this book, Bad Ab is a strategically important. Oh, wait, so I, I thought they weren't spa uh, Chaos Space Marines. I thought this happened after the Horus Heresy. Maybe I'm <coughs> off on my timeline here, but didn't he say this is in 40k 906? System positioned as a bulwark against a squat invasion, but mostly to protect from pirates and predators in the Maelstrom, a huge warp storm. In the story, Lufthuron is now the chapter master of the Astral Claws, who randomly destroyed. Yeah, 901 M41. Okay, so did they end up going to the chaos afterwards? An Imperial Investigation Fleet in 901 though it doesn't say what it's investigating. Looking into this, the Inquisition discover the issues with the Gene Seed ties, and shortly afterwards the Astral Claws declare secession. They destroy two more Imperial fleets in 902 and 903, and are then joined by the Mantis Warriors, Lamenters and Executioners. After this, the story unfolds pretty much like the Rogue Trader one. The Firehawks are the first Space Marine chapter attacked by the Secessionists, the Imperium send a first wave of chapters to end the shipping threat, and then a second wave to invade Bad Ab itself. The main addition here is what happens after the war. After being wounded in the final battle in the Palace of Thorns on Badab, Lufthuron flees into the Maelstrom with the remnants of the Astral Claws and becomes Huron Blackheart, a renegade pirate king and lord of the Red Corsairs, a force of renegade marines from various- that, That's a very sick looking design, I love that design. This chapters. Here he's armed with the Tyrant's Claw, a massive bionic arm to replace the one he lost at Badab, and is accompanied by a strange alien creature called a Hamadria, who gives him psychic powers. In the second edition that's codex, a, Huron is also your powers. way of taking a renegade chapter as opposed to just a chaos one, and his special rules oh, okay. allow you to take Imperial Terminators and support vehicles in your chaos army. Third edition had two chaos codices, Huron's absent from the first one, but he reappears in the second one in 2002. There isn't a lot of new fluff here, in this the Astral Claws had the sole responsibility for guarding the Maelstrom, and in the aftermath the Imperium suspect the taint of chaos, but then they always do. White Dwarf 303 in 2005 includes Index Astartes Rogue Sons, an article about the various renegade chapters. In this, the Bad Ab Uprising is used as an example that there can be degrees of rebellion. The Lamenters, Mantis Warriors and Executioners simply found themselves on the wrong side of the conflict, and it would seem that hubris rather than heresy kept them fighting for more than a decade. Otherwise, the Bad Ab Uprising here is a reprint of the original story, though it also points out that in the aftermath of the Siege of Bad Ab, Lufthuron made a pact with the Ruinous Powers, pledging eternal service in return for the blessings and patronage of Chaos. Here Level Omega 69. That is funny. I wonder if that, <laughs> that had to be intentional. Patronage of Chaos. Huron's back again in the 4th edition Chaos Codex, but there's nothing new here. A bigger expansion comes in the 4th edition Cities of Death book, which includes the final battle at the Palace of Thorns as a good example of urban combat. In this story, the refusal to send Gene Seed is still the cause of the conflict, but the Mantis Warriors, Lamenters and Executioners join the Astral Claws in protest over the Imperium's apparent willingness to turn against a Marine chapter. In this battle, the Star Phantoms lead a drop pod and Thunderhawk assault against the Palace of Thorns under cover of a colossal orbital bombardment. Infiltrating Star Phantoms fight underneath the palace against Astral Claws, who are described as specialists in hit and run and guerrilla tactics. Eventually, the Loyalists destroy the planet's power generators, silencing the guns and allowing a major push. And it's Captain Androcles of the Star Phantoms who wounds Lufthuron before his escape. So you can see how little details are added here and there, but all these threads are then tied together in the biggest release on this list. Forgeworld's Imperial Armor series. 
This was the first time Imperial Armour had delved into an existing part of the 40k world. Previous Imperial Armour books had been about new conflicts, and the writer Alan Bly talked about the process of gathering up all the bits and pieces seeded over the years and trying to make a cohesive narrative out of them, one that has the same sort of in-depth detail expected by the Imperial Armour series. Originally planned as one book, the narrative grew so much that it had to be split into two. Imperial Armour Volume 9 The Bad Ab War Part 1 was released in October 2010, with Volume 10, The Bad Ab War Part 2, a few months later in January 2011. In the Imperial Armour books, the Astral Claws are the leaders of a group of chapters called the Maelstrom Warders, formed to patrol the Maelstrom and nearby Imperial space. The other members of the Warders are the Mantis Warriors, the Lamenters, and the Charnel Guard, but the Charnel Guard are retasked elsewhere, and with the Warders depleted, the Astral Claws consolidate on the Badab system and start to massively increase the fleet and PDF forces. As the Badab sector gets stronger and stronger, the new Astral Claws chapter master, Luft Huron, petitions the Imperium for more forces so they can push into the Maelstrom and try and subdue it forever. Repeatedly refused, in protest he closes space lanes, redirects all materials towards strengthening his forces, and why would they not let him attempt that? Were they worried about them getting corrupted by chaos by going into the maelstrom? <clears throat> Withholds the gene seed tithe. Various other interactions with the Imperium follow, including pushes by the Warders and other chapters into the Maelstrom, but every time the Imperium retasks his support elsewhere, and it's against this background that the Imperial fleet is fired upon, the Astral Claws saying that they refuse to give way to checks upon entering the Badab Sector. The Imperium as a whole do nothing, as they see the Badab Sector as a defence against the Maelstrom, but the neighbouring Carthen Sector, who relied on the raw materials of that tithe, are incensed. They respond by trying to steal the tithe back, or by spreading rumours that the Astral Claws and Huron are traitors, and eventually all the Warders chapters published the Articles of Just Secession, saying that while they'll continue to defend the Imperium, they refuse to have anything to do with their neighbouring sectors. When the Carthen Sector's Administratum call for their own Astartes aid, and a Firehawk ship is fired upon, things spiral from there. So you end up with a much more complex reason for Huron to turn against the Imperium, one which doesn't necessarily require chaos corruption or for him to be a rogue madman. It's the story of a commander tasked with keeping a sector safe, and who takes matters into his own hands when he doesn't get the resources he needs to do so. After this, the story unfolds in a similar way, following the general plot points of the previous fluff while filling in a lot more detail and flavour. Volume 1 covers the story through the initial involvement of the Astral Claws, the Lamenters clashing in the space lanes with the Firehawks and the Marines Errant, and the escalation of the conflict. When the High Lords send investigators who demand the secessionists step down, they reinforce the Loyalist forces with the Red Scorpions, the Fire Angels, Raptors, Nova Marines, and the Howling Griffins, and the book carries the story up to the point where the secessionists are largely contained and the space lanes are secured. Volume 2 then deals with the war directly against Badab, and as various Loyalist forces are rotated out, the involvement of much darker and bloodier Loyalist chapters requested by the Inquisition. In this book we get background for the Salamanders, Mantis Warriors and Executioners, but also for those darker Loyalist chapters, the Minotaurs, the Sons of Medusa, the Space Sharks, now called the Carcharodons, the mm. Exorcists, and finally, the Star Phantoms. Both books are packed with art, and it's the first time the marine chapters are shown in the same sort of huge variety we're used to now. Armour marks and weapon types are mixed, and there are even some callbacks to the original camo colour scheme, even if they're not quite as crazy as the Tiger Stripes. The book also includes a campaign system that roughly- Man, I honestly like the old, uh, like, I, I like the more, um, realistic looking parts of the, the modern characters, but- the as far as like the armor coloring, I think it looked a lot better back then than it does now for the most part, right? The, there are some that look like very good, like the Ultramarines look very good. Um, you know, they're probably the most iconic ones, but like a lot of the the new ones, I find like just the the way they do the mixing of the colors, it looks like atrocious. I, I actually like those old style, the old colors a lot better. Roughly charts the main events of the war without being too prescriptive about who fights which battles, something previous Imperial Armour books had done. The campaign is broken down into phases, which have various restrictions on the sorts of games that can be played, and a couple of famous missions each. It also includes an expansion, Blood in the Void, for playing Zone Mortalis games to represent boarding assaults in spaceship corridors. Rules-wise, the books included two new variant army lists. 
The Tyrant's Legion represents the massively augmented PDF forces of the Bad Abs Sector, and it's a mixed force of Imperial Guard and Renegades and Heretics units led by Astral Claws. The Guard units include the conscript-like Legion Auxilia and the more trained Auxilia Armsmen, their command sections, various standard Imperial vehicles and Imperial Navy flyers from the Bad Ab fleet. The Marine units, though, are much darker, from the Retaliator squads, assault infantry with chainswords and combat shields chosen to enforce loyalty loyalty in the ranks by bloody example, to corpse takers, Astral Claws apothecaries whose purpose was to recover the gene seed of not only Astral Claws, but also any other fallen space marines they could harvest from the battlefield, regardless of whether the subject was living or dead. You get additional victory- <laughs> Regardless of whether they're living or dead? Oh my god, they're basically like necroman- like, yeah, it's like a weird mix of like, I don't even know, like necromancy and fucking- yeah, that's fucked up. Points for killing enemy Space Marine units nearby. <clears throat> the second list, the Space Marine Siege Assault Vanguard, is intended to represent larger and more heavily armoured Space Marine forces during the Siege of Bad Ab itself. This is mostly a reclassification of existing Space Marine units. It allows Siege Dreadnought talons and ground-pounding assault squads as troops, includes tactical squads equipped with Siege Mantlets to push forwards across open ground, and groups a lot of existing Marine vehicles into squadrons. It's commanded by a Siege Master with better control of reserves and who can upgrade certain elite units with various Universal Special Rules. The books also include special characters for every chapter involved in the conflict. Most of these are just in the form of profiles, but some of the main chapters, the Astral Claws, the Minotaurs, and Forge World favourite, the Red Scorpions, get multiple new characters supported by a range of model kits and conversion bits. The Astral Claws had models for Lufthuron and Amaneus Valthex, their master of the forge. The Minotaurs got Asterian Moloch and the chaplain Ivanus Encomi. And the Red Scorpions get Magister Severin Loth and Commander Karav Kul. You know what I'm actually kind of surprised? Like, every time I see one of these models, the one thing I just realized is, why, why did Games Workshop never make, like, an amiibo-style game? Like, put little chips in the bases of them and have, like, a... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, like, I don't even know, like, a PC game. I guess it would be kind of hard to have on Switch. Um, but, yeah, like, I feel like they could have made, like, an Amiibo-style game where you use your fucking guys to, like, actually have them in-game. That'd be pretty cool. Cullen. Carib Cullen's an interesting aside. He's a recurring character in the Forge World books, first appearing in the Amphilium Project as a sergeant and then in the Siege of Rax as a veteran sergeant. Other releases around this time include Tiberos the Red Wake for the Carcharodons and Brayoth Ashmantle for the Salamanders. These two Badab war books are beautiful examples of what Imperial Armour did best, finding small variation and fine detail in really big stories. And the work in these two books would have a huge influence on what Forge World did next, the Horus Heresy series that occupied the studio for the next decade. And while the Heresy series is huge and expansive and features all the fine detail of the 30th millennium, I kind of prefer the Bad Ab War. When writing Bad Ab, Alan Bly said he wanted something where Space Marines were mythical, a war of the gods. But what I've always liked about it is how human the reasoning is, and how much that adds to the Imperium as a whole. I'll leave it there for now. I'm going to do another video where I go through the actual story, at least the one in the Imperial Armor books. But I hope you've enjoyed this, I guess, retrospective. Thanks for watching. Yeah, that was really interesting. I don't think I've ever heard of this conflict before. I think. I think it was briefly mentioned in one of the videos, which is why I got suggested this, was because I had never heard of it before prior to that. But that's, uh, that's fascinating. Like, I do like the concept of having, like, it, like the, the justification for why Space Marines would be fighting Space Marines. You know, if you're one of those people that's, like, really focused on the RP while you're doing your tabletop battles... You, ha you now have a justification for it or, you know, because obviously, you know, it doesn't really make sense for people to be, you know, space marines to be fighting space marines unless one's a chaos faction outside of this. Uh, but now that you have this, like you have, basically it makes sense for this to happen. It makes sense for other conflicts to happen. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.